Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, the Super Bowl is coming soon, but the Super Bowl of politics and national security is long since upon us. And I am very happy to be bringing a true American hero, somebody I've admired, somebody we've covered on this show, and someone I've been really looking forward to having a conversation with, a guy who is a primetime quarterback who continues to rise to the moment for America and for freedom. The great and powerful Colonel Alex Vindman is finally on Independent Americans. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me on. Uh, frankly, I'm eager to talk to you for a couple of different reasons. Turns out that we almost across paths. You were an OCS graduate uh, back in 2001, and I had just I was coming back from Korea, and I started my assignment at OCS. I was, you know, like out of nowhere. I was supposed to go to the Airborne School and be an instructor there, and you know, pick up some cool ba badges, get a bunch of jumps. But they sent me off to the o o OCS, and I got there in September. So probably right after you left. Um, wow, that is that is a cool overlap. I think that's that's one. The other ones are frankly, you're, you're talking to independents, uh, which is you know probably going to be the decisive constituent uh, constituency in 2024. Uh, they certainly showed their strength in I think New Hampshire, in my opinion, in my analysis, it was the independents that you know uh, closed the, the the what was supposed to be a, a yawning gap between Trump and any of his. Uh, uh, any any of his other challengers and independents delivered for for Nikki Haley. Uh, they are not interested in in the, in MAGA or Trump, which is good. And then you also talk to veterans and first responders, and you know uh, sometimes I'm not sure if I get the most the warmest reception. Uh, I do work for a veterans group also, but I those those are my people, you know, career public servants. So uh, again, happy to talk to you and and happy to you know uh, reach out to your to your audience. Well, we're thrilled to have you. It's definitely a supportive audience, and I've uh, admired your your heroism and your courage and your voice for a long time. Uh, we covered it on this show when you were still on active duty, and we were, you know, supporting. I think Colonel, thank you, Colonel Vinman, was the hashtag that I was kicking out there, and 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 I went back and looked at it because we were tracking and covering your story throughout that. And I, I want to get into that. I want to get into Ukraine. I want to get into the attacks on the U.S maybe even get your Super Bowl predictions. Um, but we also had a, had a great connection. Your wife put us in touch, um, thanks to the magic of, of X Twitter. There's a lot of downsides to it. You and I have both been vocal about that. But one of the good sides is your wife was able to connect us. And then you met my wife at Sundance last week, yeah. which which uh, is, is, is got to be wild. But let me start by asking you uh, the question I ask everybody. Alex, where are you and how are you? I'm in, well, I just flew back in from up north. Uh, I'm in South Florida. I'm a recent transplant. I think you have connections down here too. Uh, we moved down here in March of last year for a couple of different reasons. Frankly, the, uh, it turns out I'm a more of a warm weather guy. You know, I spent my life in like, you know, cold places, like Korea, uh, Germany, Russia, Ukraine, uh, you know, to, at various embassies. But it turns out that I thrive in, in warm weather. So, you know, enjoying uh, South Florida. Uh, but traveling a lot, um, and uh, it's it's been lovely here. So in, in general, good, super super busy, but good. You know, I, I, I was going to save this for later, but maybe maybe you can uh, run for office down there. I know your brother's running in Virginia, but uh, maybe you could run against DeSantis or, or or something statewide down there. What do you think? Uh, that that's that's a tough one. <laughs> I think the fact is that probably uh, uh, I'd be divorced if that happened. <laughs> My race Rachel is not interested in that. Um, and frankly, I think I'm doing a lot of good on the outside. I'm certainly helping my twin brother run for, for Virginia 7. Uh, his, his district is going to be absolutely critical to turning the House um, Dem uh, to keeping it out of MAGA hands. And, you know, people haven't really thought about it so much. But in the closest of scenarios in which uh, basically Trump and Biden somehow get equal um, electoral college votes, it would get kicked over to the house mm -hmm. and this would be in the house gets sworn on the, on, on the 3rd of January. And you have uh, basically the certifications occur right thereafter. So it would be the new house, uh, potentially a d democratic house that would be uh, making those decisions instead of this craziness that we have right now uh, in, in Washington, DC. So I think, uh, you know, it's a long way of saying, I think I could do a lot of good on the outside. I work for vote vets, um, as a senior advisor, so helping veterans get elected to office. It's not just veterans, actually, it's career public servants. So 
you know, we've got uh, former uh, CIA uh, officers, we've got State Department folks, we've got DOD civilians, all sorts of different folks. And then I also run a national security and defense think tank in Vovets. And that's why, you, you know, you see me um, in the news media writing on this topic and engaging with, with uh, decision makers to try to provide some some counsel, which they usually dismiss, but, you know. Uh, I think America is listening. And, I, and I've been, you know, thankful for your, your, your voice. It's been like a conscience. But I got to ask you, you've been on such a wild and interesting journey. You, your wife, your brother. I mean, you go from, you know, immigrating to Brooklyn, to the Army, to Sundance Film Festival and an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I mean, uh, you know, it's I had a, a very similarly weird experience back in 2004 when I challenged George Bush in the war, but it was a very different time. It was a very different experience. But can you talk about what that's been like to, to being, you know, a, a dedicated soldier? We were in, I think, Fort Benning and Iraq around the same time. Sure. And then you're literally doing a cameo in Curb Your Enthusiasm, which was amazing, by the way. And I celebrate. I said, holy shit, it's Vindman. This is great. Um, but but that's a very surreal experience to go through. Can you talk about what that's been like for you? I guess to a certain extent, I think, you know, there's a couple of different fa uh, uh, things that kind of weigh in on, you know, why some of these things kind of uh, um, wind up in my in my background and my like, you know, biography. First of all, I, I think I tend to be a little bit less uh, risk averse. I'm open to new experiences. I, I, I like to travel. I like to, you know, try new things. And, uh, you know, there was an instinct against initially about against doing Curb Your Enthusiasm it was like too off, too off brand, you know, just fresh out of the military what kind of what kind of thing is that to do. And then that episode itself was was a bit weird, but it was good. It was fun. And I'm glad I did it. Uh, I did it in part because uh, actually we had a brand new niece out there and we hadn't visited and they were flying me out there. So that was cool. A, t a twofer. Uh, but in general, I tend to be, again, you know, um, a little bit more i've got a higher risk tolerance i think it's more that i calibrate uh, uh calibrate risk um more finely like mensurate as we say in the military mm -hmm. and therefore i could i could give myself larger parameters for for uh, making some decisions and then that part of that's i think family dna um you know i think my family has an interesting background i talked i talked about it in my book um you know my dad survived he's he's 91 he'll be 92 this year he survived the war, you know, the family fled, they lived, uh, um, he, he grew up in the Soviet Union and, you know, managed to, to work his way up um, into uh, positions of authority, uh, he started over as a 47 year old. So I think there's something, a combination of nature and nurture, like what, mm. I, what was in the DNA and, and kind of uh, about my own experiences and, and, and how I lived that allowed me to do all these weird things, but it is very surreal, you know. Mm. Smoking cigars with uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger at his home for a couple hours not not <laughs> something I would have expected. <laughs> well, I'm Sunday. glad you're in those places because you know. people need to hear from you, and sometimes you know those crossovers are are, are what break through the most. And uh, I don't know if you're going to have a cameo in the final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm coming up or not. Uh, wink, wink. Yeah, no spoilers. Uh, but but I think. Uh, we're going to need Curb because the world is on fire and we need humor and some perspective and uh, and a laugh once in a while. But what's going on in the world is is no laughing matter. You know, part of why you uh, you were at Sundance is for this new film, uh, yeah. War Game, right, which is a simulation of what could happen uh, after uh, 2004. Right. And you guys yeah. are in a, war, a simulated war room with Wes Clark and Heidi yeah. uh, uh, Hellcamp and others. But yeah. let me ask, the question I was going to ask you is. You've been so vocal and powerful and important on Ukraine. We're at this point now where it feels like the real fight for Ukraine is actually not in Ukraine. It's in the American Congress. And it feels like Ukraine is losing. You've been outspoken about uh, what more Biden could do, what more NATO could do, what more Congress can do. But can you lay out maybe with clarity for folks that might not be as deep into it as you are? What does it look like if we continue on this course and if the GOP led Congress pulls the plug on Ukraine? What happens to the world if, if, if that happens? Yeah. So it's, it's you know, at the base level, especially for the, the, the soldiers out there, it just means a lot more bloodshed, a lot more Ukrainians dying, uh, longer war, a lot more civilians dying because um, Russia is not restrained in, in uh, prosecuting war against uh, the military, certainly uh, very, very actively uh, trying to terrorize the population and cow the population into submission. 
so that's the, the you know the kind of on just a human level that, that's that's part of the picture i think it's also very very dangerous for, for the us from a national security perspective this war was going to be tough 20 uh sorry this year was going to be tough 2024 was going to be tough reason is that russia you know is about three and a half times the size has a an economy you know somewhere in the ballpark of almost 10 times the size of ukraine's and they shifted to war footing you know about 40 percent of the state budget is now oriented on the war that's an enormous amount of spending that's the sum total of everything that the u.s provided the eu provided all the donors provided plus what ukraine is, is spending on this war russia is now spending by itself so it's a massive massive expenditure and what they're doing is they're reinvesting back into their massive, their massive uh, military industrial base. You know, they had a enormous capacity, uh, a war making capacity in the Soviet Union. Some of that wheeled, wheeled back, some of it atrophied, but no, they're now putting resources back in, having a hard time uh, really producing high, high end, you know, top quality gear. They could do it in low, uh, in low quantities because they could steal, you know, components from from the West, but they can't produce some massive numbers. But what they can do is renovate the uh, old Soviet stuff and, and put it back into working order. And then they're mobilizing thousands of troops a month, you know, tens of thousands of troops a month. And that's a recipe for a very, very uh, difficult war. On the Ukrainian side, it's it's uh, a problem in that uh, they have not really kind of um, uh, shifted to war footing. They have not energized the industrial base in the same way. Uh, they haven't really mobilized uh, significantly. They have a basically a prohibition on uh, anybody below the age of 27 serving because they want those young men to have a life before they you know risk their lives in combat. Uh, but that's not the way you fight a war to win. Mm -hmm. The training has been inadequate. I think the US plays a role in that. And we focused on <clears throat> you know, frontline troops, uh, you know, what, what, what you would understand as battle drills, you know, kind of just the basics shoot, move, communicate, not what you need to win uh, modern wars. What's required is combined arms, being able to orchestrate artillery, air defense, armor, infantry, um, all of that together at, at a, engineers at a specific point in order to achieve your, your you know, decisive effects, you know, uh, win. Um, and that's not happened. Logistics, massively lacking. We've provided them thousands and thousands of pieces of equipment but without the warranty, without the repair parts to be able to sustain right. them, it's it's actually in a lot of ways it's a bit of negligence. Um, so this was going to be a tough year. It becomes that much more difficult when you don't have the U.S. in the game. The U.S. is referred to as the arsenal of democracy. We have the most powerful military in the world, the most powerful industrial uh, base to support the military, and there is no combination of countries that could that could uh, fill the gap of the U.S. absence. So what that means, and I think the Europeans are going to try, they're going to put in, they're putting in additional resources. By the way, I think your audience should know that the, the Europeans have actually spent more money than the U.S. They just spend it differently. They provide budget support. They provide humanitarian assistance. They don't have the means to do military assistance, but they've provided more billions than we have. And uh, the other kind of little known secret, I'll, I'll be writing about this in, in more detail, is frankly, this this war has been a huge, huge uh, boon to the US military industrial complex. It has been, it is, it is, it is almost a dream come true. You know, losing, from a geopolitical standpoint, it's a disaster. But from a very kind of bureaucratic military perspective, it's a dream come true. Because what what the military was has been doing is been shifting off all its old broken stuff that they would have to then sp uh, uh, spend money to like recycle and get rid of. They've given it away, and one for one almost they've gotten brand new shiny stuff off the production lines. You know the the best gear, and this has been big long term reset. You know twenty years of war, it, it's that it, we've we've not really conducted a reset. This has been this is the reset on the backs of the Ukrainians. Mm fighting for, for democracy around the world. So there's a lot of different things that that uh, we we should have been doing along. The minimum is passing Ukraine supplemental, you know, even in our imperfect way um, with all these deficiencies that, deficiencies that I made, uh, um, slow support, very, very incremental. We at minimum should at least sustain it. 
because uh, other otherwise it, it really starts to look really um it could be disastrous uh, it's unlikely that ukraine is going to fold very very unlikely uh, the russians don't have the strength to overwhelm the ukrainians but they can take additional territory they can inflict a lot of casualties and they can extend the war and set conditions for maybe a, a compromise uh where the ukrainians have to give up large chunks of territory and all that does is, you know, uh, delays a, another round of war between Russia and Ukraine and a war between the U.S. and uh, Euro Europe and, and Russia. Alex, you set the landscape well. I think you set what the future can look like well. You've been, you know, consistent in, in pulling apart what's most important during the various evolutions of this of this war. Um, I have said, you know, Biden has been putting Ukraine and Zelensky in this game of mother may I for far too long, where it's a piece here, a piece there, everything from the high Mars to the F-16s. It's the drip, drip, drip uh, um, strategy, which I think is really hamstrung the Ukrainians. But obviously, Biden and Trump will have very different approaches to Ukraine. But America is not really great at supporting our own wars for very long. Right. Yeah. We, we, they feel you, so you and I saw that serving in the Middle East in the last 20 years. It feels like America is tired of this war. The, the repeated attacks from right wing media, from from presidential candidates, uh, you know, the distractions on the border and, and all these other arguments have kind of worn down public support. It, it, it almost mirrors Biden. Right. It feels like they're getting beaten up. They're getting worn out and it doesn't have the energy and popularity it used to have. How do we win the political battle? Yeah. To, to support Ukraine. If Ukraine is a political candidate that's way down in the polls and we need Ukraine to win, how do we in America move opponents of Ukraine to support Ukraine to victory politically? So uh, you're, you're right. Ukraine is not the shiny thing. Uh, it, it's not stealing the airways the way it was for the first six months. And I think the fact is uh, the media shifted off Ukraine as a topic. Yeah. Shifted over to uh, a busy domestic agenda all the Trump scandals, the indictments, now now an election. Uh, I think the American public actually still continues to support Ukraine. It's just the support is softened, and it's not really, and it's not nobody's tried to harness it. If, mm. if frankly Biden didn't have an election year, he probably would be maybe doing a he could do a better job of harnessing it. And right now he's focused on the most important thing, which is keeping our democracy uh, safe, which means right. winning the twenty twenty four election. So. I understand to a certain extent, you know, this year has a lot of competing challenges. Ukraine has to be one of them. Uh, I think the fact is that um, the kinds of things that kept the attention on Ukraine early on was were, you know, atrocities committed by Russia. They're still occurring. So uh, we could we could almost guarantee that Russia is going to do something you know heinous and it'll be back in the news cycle for, for uh, bits of time. Um, and, you know, we have to have powerful voices like your, your voice constantly talking about the fact that this is not a far off a war. What happens in Ukraine actually is affecting us today. If you think about it, the reason that we, we had that uh, a pretty de decent surge of, uh, in regards to inflation was in part COVID, uh, it was supply chain issues, but it was also Russia. We were basically, Putin was charging us all attacks. He was charging us oil and gas taxes because mm -hmm. he disrupted the oil and gas markets. He was charging us, you know, uh, food taxes because uh, it was a shock to the to the world food market, losing access to uh, um, to, to grains from um, Ukraine. It's the breadbasket of, of not just Europe, but of the world. So I think the fact is that we're it's affecting our lives. And if you ask m almost all Americans. Minus the, you know, the, the really hardcore MAGA, I think, and, and you asked the question of, you know, what, do you support the aspirations of a democracy struggling to fend off, a, you know, an authoritarian regime? They, they would say invariably yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put in like Russia and Ukraine, that answer changes because of the way our politics have been polarized and that you have one man that uh, loves his dictators. You know, Donald Trump loves his dictators. And he's a, a huge cheerleader for Vladimir Putin, and he feels slighted by Ukraine because you know they were, they were they didn't bend to his will, and that was a factor in his first impeachment. Uh, so he's basically a vengeful, you know, uh, he, he's a vengeful, um, hateful individual. 
I think is, is, you know, I don't think those are extremes. I think those are pretty accurate definitions. So I think he's, you know, he favors the authoritarian as opposed to democracy. And that changes the, changes the responses you get from, you know, uh, uh, from MAGA folks. But otherwise, you take those names out, and I think you, you get uh, large support. But, I mean, look, the reality is this is 2024. Uh, this election is going to be about our um, wh whether we have a democracy in 2025. Uh, we have a very, very, very busy geopolitical um, landscape. In a lot of ways, probably the most complex in our lifetimes, or at least in our adult lifetimes, uh, you know, since the uh, post-Cold War era. Yes, we had two wars in the Middle East, but in a lot of ways, those were kind of simple. Uh, we were fighting global war on terror. We have a conflict in the Middle East that looks like it's boiling over. Uh, we just had a, an unfortunate series of casualties in um, uh, in Syria on the border with uh, Jordan. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty well familiar with that place. I mean, it came to my attention when I was in the Pentagon and, and managing the relationship with Russia after they involved themselves in Syria. Um, and we've, you know, we've, we spilled blood there before uh, on, on several occasions. Uh, that the all the disruption in commercial shipping in uh, around the uh, Arabian Peninsula, the what looks like a, could be a, a broadening conflict with the Houthis, and then of course you've got you know North Korea watching out what's going on. Iran, you know, doesn't want to provoke the U.S. directly, but we might stu stumble into a conflict. And if we fail in all these places and in Ukraine, the Chinese are, are right there trying to figure out how to crush uh, Taiwanese democracy. They just had a powerful election. They voted for a pro-democracy candidate that was, uh, you know, unbending to uh, Chinese intimidation. And that is, you know, frankly, that could be a game changer. If, if the Chinese at some point smell blood in the water and step in and uh, there's a, there's a military, militarized effort to subdue Taiwan, the U.S. would get involved and then you have the world uh, entirely at war. Alex, can we can we build on that? Because you, you took us to the Red Sea and the U.S. the attacks on U.S. troops, which I think are really important. I wanted to go there. We've covered it on this show. Now we're over 130 attacks on U.S. troops. You know, it, it was only a matter of time, unfortunately, before American service members have died. Now they have. I think part of why I and so many other people respect you is because you're willing to call out the Democrats and Biden. Right. You're, you're not just falling in lockstep. You know, I, I don't know. If, I assume you're a Democrat, but I almost wish you were. And I, I do wish you were an independent. I wish your brother was running as an independent because I feel like so many folks just just fall in line with the Democratic Party and with Biden in particular. But you've called him out and, and uh, on Ukraine and other areas. Um, you said, you know, the Chinese will pounce if they smell blood in the water. Does do our enemies smell blood in the water because Biden's too passive? Is he too slow to respond? Whether it's Afghanistan, then it's Ukraine, now it's the Houthis, maybe it's China. Is he just too slow to respond too consistently in a way that jeopardizes our national security, but also, frankly, doesn't play well politically at home? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, frankly, he gets he, his biggest shortfall right now is the perception of his age uh, and senility. And if he if he showed demonstrated vigor, you know, if he was out there, you know, in Colorado uh, uh, at Sundance or or actually in Utah at Sundance skiing on the ski slopes, uh, that would be a pretty darn powerful image. You know, having him vigorous and involved, um, and not being managed by staff, which is a lot of what's going on, is being managed by staff. He actually has pretty good instincts. I mean, the guy doesn't. You know, if you catch him uh, talking about things, he's pretty he's pretty aggressive. I think, you know, it's that kind of uh, northern Pennsylvania Catholic uh, type of swagger he's got going on. Mm -hmm. or something. So I think the problem is that he gets rain. He, he even though he's the president, he has large teams around him that, you know, in a way, try to manage him and, and, and uh, wheel him back. And I think he needs to be himself. Mm. And I think if that was the case, he'd probably uh, uh, he'd come across better to the American public in terms of um, whether our adversaries smell blood in the water. I think, yes. Uh, they sense, you know, there's a there, there's almost a thread that can the U.S. actually win a war? You know, is the U.S. capable of winning a war? And it's not just a Democrat thing. It's a re Republican thing. Frankly, we had multiple different administrations involved in 20 years of war, and uh, none of them could really quite figure it out. Um, you know, Iraq isn't, hasn't completely crumbled uh, like Afghanistan. 
it actually is still, you know, somewhat of a functioning democracy that in, in certain regards has to appease uh, uh, Iran, its powerful neighbor, but still acts independently oftentimes, but has, you know, large uh, Shia populations and things of that nature. So um, I think we probably do need to be, and it doesn't mean that we need to wage war constantly. It doesn't mean that we need to attack anybody that slights us, uh, like, you know, an erratic crazy man like Donald Trump might do. Uh, take the, the scenario, the throwaway scenario that gets proposed to him and, you know, say, that's the one I want to go with. That's that's not what we need. We need somebody, a steady, capable individual. Um, but we probably do need to act with some some sort of, of uh, vigor and uh, recognize that mm. uh, there is um, a growing threat. You know, the perceptions of, of U.S. strength, regardless of the fact that we have this massive economy that's chugging along like a you know, a, a train that just won't stop. We have the most powerful economy and growing faster than any other economy in the world, gap growing between us and the Chinese. They're, they're not missing that. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, what, that's a basis for, for U.S. power. But in a lot of other ways, we seem inability, uh, unable to act, uh, unable to act. Our, our politics seem paralyzed. We're not able to make decisions on our own national security interests. So I think there is some of that. But I guess, you know, I, it appeals to me to also, you know, kind of not be beholden to one side or the other. I'm a, I'm a, I, I still consider myself a free agent, but we have a two party system. The election in 2024 is going to be between a Democrat and a Republican. We can't, frankly, have any other anybody else in there because the margins are going to be so thin. And if you take a look at be, between somebody that's done in a lot of ways superbly, and I think Americans might disagree. But if you think about what he, the long-term investments Biden's done for the U.S. economically, infrastructure, um, Inflation Reduction Act, and things of that nature, these are uh, Chips Act. These are long-term investments in, in uh, you know, basically bringing back manufacturing to the U.S. He's done great there. I think foreign policy could could definitely be uh, more muscular in defending U.S. interests. Uh, that would be good for our allies. That would warn off our adversaries. But if you look at the flip side, and what would happen if you had a Trump come in, it would be an absolute disaster. You know, almost could be forgiven for electing Trump once. Mm. We would lose all the, the uh, trust and confidence of the entire world uh, of allies, uh, and frankly, probably of our adversaries also. Uh, and they would see they'd see it as an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to extract whatever they wanted to. Uh, all they would have to do is, you know, cater to, to Trump's vanity and they could get away with almost whatever they wanted to because that's the way uh, he's easily manipulated. Alex, I, I think you're right on, on on so much of that. And I think most independents see see it the same way. And, and many of them maybe are coming over or maybe they won't come over until they flip that switch. And I think you're right. We've talked about it on the show about the threat of a third party candidate at the presidential level. But where I see the opportunity is down ballot, right? You represent this kind of new generation of, of national security experience leaders like Amy McGrath has been on this show. We've had other folks on this show that kind of represent the next generation, Wes Moore, the governor of Maryland, right? Now, th there's also an opportunity to move that Democratic Party in, in a better direction, but also to leave the Democratic Party. So if a guy like you runs as an independent, say, for Senate against Marco Rubio, I think we've got a very interesting, interesting scenario here. Do you see any interest uh, from yourself? And in particular, you know, generals coming out of the military, colonels coming out of the military, somebody like a Mark Milley. I've made the argument we need them in politics, yeah. but they don't want to get into politics. Does an independent, unaffiliated option offer a pathway for people like you in a place like Florida or a person like Milley in, in, in another environment down ballot, not for president, but for governor, for, for Senate, for Congress? So let me I'll just set aside the, the whole question of, you know, whether it's me or not. I guess, you know, I, I think people would be data driven and have to understand how you overcome the, the massive barriers of, a, of the party systems. And they, they work their way down to states. Uh, that's how fundraising uh, er, er, basically is organized uh, through the parties. Uh, there is no fundraising apparatus for independence. You could try to do a grassroots campaign. Frankly, my twins uh, campaign is very, very grassroots. I mean, he's gotten 60,000 donations from across the country. So maybe with the right, very right person you might be able to do that kind of fundraising game, uh, but you would have to overcome a huge barrier in terms of the two-party system. And, um, you know, the, the the important thing, frankly, between having 
at least two parties that function is that there's an exchange of ideas. You have one party that, you know, is on the left, one party is on the right, that, that's fine. The, the a population could, you know, uh, move between those two. But you have to have at least two parties because right now, let's say uh, if it was a functional Republican Party, if it was a you know Re Reagan Republican Party, they would be highly critical of uh, what they would say would, would be insufficient support to Ukraine. And uh, on that basis, they would make a case to the American public that they're, you know, we need to do better in terms of protecting our interests uh, uh, abroad. That's not the way the elections are usually won, but they could make that case. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have that right now. You basically have you 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 fall in line with the Democratic Party because that at least you have a democracy and they're imperfect. But you know the uh, things are not going to completely fall apart. And frankly, if they're successful in twenty twenty four, at least you have a Ukraine supplemental. If the Republican Party wins, and guess what? There's not going to be a Ukraine supplemental. There's not going to be additional aid to Ukraine, to Israel. There's not going to be a, a additional aid to Taiwan. There is, there's probably going to, they might be a war with Mexico. Who knows? I mean, yeah. you know, crazy stuff. Like we might start nuking hurricanes or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like you can, I mean, we're so far afield that this conversation in a different context might make a lot more sense, but in this, you know, in this, the, the high, the peril of the moment where everything is all in on you know preserving our democracy, I, I think it's really not the not necessarily the right time. So why don't we why don't we have this conversation? Let's, let's put a pin in it, right? Let's put a pin in it because yeah. you know if if there is a a surge of independent candidates who can create a fundraising network that's led by former military folks, because in a place like Florida, you probably can't win as a Democrat right now, but you might be able to win as an independent, right? Well, I mean, not, maybe not you, but someone, yeah, right? If yeah. The Rock goes home to, I always use him as the example, right? Yeah, if The yeah. Rock goes home to Miami and decides to run against Marco Rubio, he could run as a Green Party candidate yeah. and he'd still, I, I I'd still be right. betting on him to win, right? I think you're right. But I would say that, you, you know, your point on military, uh, public servants, first responders, those folks running for office is a no-brainer. Yeah, uh, they are perceived as honorable. They're perceived perceived as oath keepers in the in the proper sense. Right. That, you know, they will live up to their obligations um, to uh, support and defend the Constitution, uh, that they are not going to be, you know, uh, purely self-seeking um, uh, and self-enriching. Uh, and I think, you know, that is why I actually work with Bo Vets, because I think, you know, we have a awesome, awesome group of candidates that we support across the country. These are all not, you know, radical. Um, we don't have radical uh, Democrats. We have moderate Democrat, um, you know, pro national security, uh, not not like regressive in their thinking about social issues and, and stuff like that. I mean, frankly, probably like uh, in a lot of ways, the independent uh, independents would 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 be highly supportive of of these folks and. Part of but they is. are, but they are all Democrats, right? I mean, maybe there's a pl place in the future where vote vets and others would actually support an independent candidate. I don't know if there's a world where that exists, but, but I think that's world. what that's what folks are are hoping for. Yeah. I think many folks are hoping that somebody will step up. If and you'll use you as an example, if a guy like you said, you know what, I'm not going to run as a Democrat. I'm going to run as an independent. Who's going to support me, right? Like, I think I think there's special leaders that can tra that that can bust this paradigm. And I'm always, you know, advocating for them. We've had them on this show. I mean, Barry McCaffrey came on and told me he might run for mayor against uh, Eric Adams here in New York. He's so frustrated by the situation. But it's a time that I think celebrates and requires leaders. And you're one of them. I got I, I'm going to you're generously going to stick around. So Patreon members. Uh, you're going to get some extra content with the Colonel. Stick around for that. We'll go back to the car question and a couple of the other classics uh, for our for our dedicated Patreon members. But a final question for you, sir. Wrap it all up. Let's talk about a different kind of battlefield. Super Bowl is coming up next week. We got Kansas City versus versus uh, San Francisco in this epic clash. Who are you picking and why? OK, so first of all, uh, I do have to set a second your nomination for, uh, you know, the rock to run down here. Uh, that I he he did have my vote. By the way, supposedly his mother lived in my in my uh, in my neighborhood, my subdivision, some like houses down. So, um, a lo long long time ago. Um, so, I uh, I for for whatever reason, I always had a kind of affinity for the 49ers growing up. I, I grew up in New York City, so I like the Giants. But if it wasn't the Giants, 
then I, I really like the 49ers uh, for, for a long time. But you know what? I think I might have to go with St. Louis, uh, you know, because of Taylor Swift. See. St. Louis. Yeah. Taylor Kansas Swift. City. Yeah. Yeah. But you got, you're right there. I mean, yeah, I'm with I, you on that. I'm with you on that. Who, who, what kind of madman would go against Taylor Swift? And, 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 look, I, and look, I've always been using the rock as the example, but if Taylor Swift ran for office, who wants to run against Taylor Swift for anything? You can hate on her all you want, but you put her in any race in America to include for president. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, this, this shows right. like the paradigm busting potential that certain people have. Right. I think this is, the, you know, I'm, I'm being, I'm joking a bit. I think, frankly, I think the, the Cardinals probably might, might uh, have it, but um, I do want, I did want to make a point about the fact that, you know, like what kind of madman is running uh, the Republican party where they have a, a, you know, a women problem where they can't get women to show up for them. And then they attack Taylor Swift. I mean, what kind of mad man comes up with that? Strategy? And Jason, and look by default, the Kelsey brothers, who yeah. are like the ultimate populist candidate. I, I had uh, Smirkanich on last week. We talked about Jason Kelsey as a political candidate in Pennsylvania and how well he would do. I mean, you put Jason Kelsey and, and Taylor Swift up on, on any platform, they're going to crush everybody. You get every demographic. You get you get all the young women and you get the old white dads that, that you know, and everybody who plays football and watches yeah. football. I mean, if you could get the NFL and Taylor Swift, that's maybe the two most powerful voting demographics in America, right? Dot, that's dot worse powers. Powers daughter fathers uh you know are uh, also supportive that's it right yeah. well listen man i i have my testimony actually i'm i'm grateful for all your leadership uh you're going to stick around for some extra content but i really hope you will come back again it's it, it's it's been way too long since uh we finally had you on the show i'm grateful that you're here but in, in all sincerity you're a true american hero you're a role model you speak truth to power um you're the kind of leader that this moment requires and, and it's a true honor to finally have a conversation with you and know that uh, me and so many others had your back when you were in uniform and have your back now and are rooting for you forever so thank you for all your leadership and and for embodying what true patriotism is all about thank you paul all right. Stay vigilant, my friend.